Welcome to the Total Connector Show. I'm really looking forward to my next talk with Dr. Tim Ball um, on my the, the Total Connector podcast show and YouTube um, vi uh, video. And um, yeah, it's you know there was uh, the the reason for this um, for this talk is because there's been a you know heated debate about um, by non scientists uh, on Twitter you know triggering with provocative statements uh, pseudo scientific you know non scientific statements uh, allegations accusations uh, throwing around you know with with words like climate deniers who is who is denying the climate why is there climate denial you know why is there climate skepticism and not really asking the real questions that you know the the essential questions um, um, there's I mean, in my op strong opinion and, and observation there, uh, I hardly know anyone who really, uh, you know, de denies or, or, uh, or questions the reality of climate change. Uh, for me, it's a very natural cycle. And the question, I think the core question is here, definitely, um, is it really a uh, human cause? And, you know, who says that? Who, uh, who makes this, you know, who, who, um, who delivers the data, the the, uh, the factual research behind it, especially when it comes to his, you know, to the real uh, core interdisciplinary si science uh, fields behind climate change or previously called global warming. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's why I want to have Dr. Tim Ball on. Um, and so we can really uh, talk in depth about the root causes, uh, the science behind it, and the, the you know the factual basis behind uh, climate change and why is there what kind of you know is there propaganda behind it who is behind it what's the intention what's the motivation behind it and uh, why is there so much confusion and uh, misconceptions and distortion of facts in the mainstream narrative you know mainstream media in the mainstream science um uh funding you know by governments uh, the, di the different institutions that are being funded by governments so uh yeah so we're going to talk about a, a spectrum of topics and hope you're going to enjoy this if you have any questions please write me uh hello at the total and give me a follow like sub subscribe share whatever you do would really help me uh, get out this knowledge all right uh well that's what you do this is my talk with dr tim ball Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kay Van Devani. My very special guest again is Dr. Tim Ball. Um, Tim, if I may call you that, um, thank you so much for your time, for coming back on my show. Well, well thanks for the opportunity. And uh, as I said, any as I said before, any chance to help people understand uh, the extreme uh, con job that the global warming issue is is got to benefit the world. Yeah, exactly. So before we start off, um, Tim, um, for those of you, my, my, my listeners, and a lot of people know you already, uh, you know, from, uh, from your publications, Twitter, your uh, whatever, or your blog, um, can you, uh, let, me, let me just, you know, do a, a short summary. You're the author of um, uh, definitely two books, uh, uh, Human Caused, sort of, <laughs> Human Caused Global Warming, The Biggest Deception in History, and The Deliberate uh, corruption of climate science is available on Amazon, and uh, you know I've also seen uh, a number of uh, you know interviews and presentations you gave, uh, factually based, scientifically based on this uh, whole um, you know seemingly controversial um, um, climate change or, or, or global warming, previously called uh, um, I don't know what to call it, fraud or hoax, or um, let me just be neutral, you know, this, this whole discussion. Uh, and maybe we can put this uh, to a rest because, uh, you know, a, f a few days ago or a week ago, uh, a prominent podca podcast, you know, he started uh, triggering people with, um, by, you know, um, uh, with, with uh, you know, with statements that are just... Um, um, not not have you know not being researched or verified or anything, and then when he brought also your name amongst other uh, people into this um, uh, into this whole discussion and uh, alleging that you know you uh, 
that you are ob- allegedly you are being funded by the oil and gas industry. And I thought, so now now is the real time to you know to do a tabula rasa, and 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 uh, you know have a straightforward and honest and uh, and factual based discussion. So first of all. Um, Again, thank you, thank you so much for your time, uh, Tim. Can you, um, before we go into this whole thing, you had a um, a lawsuit against you by a, uh, by a name, by a guy named Michael Mann, uh, um, and the issue I think I think was uh, just the keyword, the jockey stick uh, topic. Hockey, hockey stick, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, my, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can. Michael. Michael Mann was um, a, a researcher out of Penn State University. Um, they um, they brought him into Penn State um, from the University of Virginia uh, because one of the problems is that they were having when they were saying that it's warmer now than it's ever been, um, and uh, that warming is due to humans. The great what what's that thing about uh, the the great tragedy of science is is a, a, um, a an ugly fact right the great tragedy of hypothesis an ugly fact and the ugly fact was that the world was warmer than today a thousand years ago in a period that climate science has known by the way for a long long time uh, and it's called the medieval warm period it, it centers on about 1000 um, AD and temperatures were, depending on which part of the world you're in, but anywhere from two to three degrees Celsius warmer than today. So when people say, oh, it's gonna get two degrees Celsius warmer and that'll be the end of the world. Well, sorry, just look at your history and you'll find out that's what it was a thousand years ago. And in fact, that medieval warm period was a period of great boom in, in Europe particularly, uh, you look at civilizations around the world, they all benefited. The, the, uh, if you look at Central America, the Inca and all of these people benefited from that warmer world. And, and so this was their problem, was they were saying, well, it's warmer today than it's ever been. And people like me who knew the history and had reconstructed the history were saying, no, sorry, it was warmer a thousand years ago. And so they had to get rid of that. They had to attack it. And in, in fact, uh, there was an email that, that uh, went out uh, from uh, Phil Jones, who was at, um, uh, uh, it was the UK Met Office. And he said, we've got to get rid of this medieval warm period. You know, in other words, we've got to rewrite the history. And, and so um, that's what happened. Michael Mann, a, a, a researcher who was at Virginia and then moved to Penn State, uh, he came out with this graph that um, he claimed his computer models created that showed that there was virtually no temperature change for a thousand years. And then in the, tw- in the 20th century, the temperature suddenly went up quite dramatically. And of course, this this uh he called it the hockey stick he was the guy that named it because it looked like a hockey stick mm-hmm. um, and and it fit it fit their narrative perfectly but the, the problem is it, it ignores all of the evidence that shows i mean i mean thousands of pieces of evidence and 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 the, the argument they say oh well it was just in, in in europe it was warmer no we now know it was warmer around the world there's there's thousands of pieces of evidence and research from around the world showing it was warmer it was a global issue and and so th- this is this is what we're dealing with now is uh because they they wanted they needed the hockey stick to prove their argument that humans were the cause of climate change. And th- the problem is that, that um, the hockey stick didn't get rid of the medieval warm period. And the question you have to come to is, well, if it was so warm a thousand years ago, what caused that warming? If you're telling me now that the current warming is only due to humans. So, so this is the problem that they had. Uh, as I said, uh, lovely hypotheses destroyed by ugly facts. And, and so they set about uh, creating a graph that eliminated the medieval warm period. So that, that's what the hockey stick did. It, it supposedly showed scientific evidence that there was no medieval warm period. 
but but it was totally concocted and and as i say i i think it's the biggest scam and one of the biggest scams in history certainly the biggest scam in climate history um, and and of course this is what it this is all about um left wing uh, what the left wing need to do is they have to first rewrite history that's that's what marxists are famous for we rewrite the history and then we say well the the history shows that humans are the problem and and capitalism is the problem and all the rest of it well this is what they did with with the climate change issue they 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 rewrote the history and said no the warm period didn't exist and and therefore the 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 current warming is due to humans and capitalism and we got to get rid of human development and capitalism and all the and co2 and all the rest of it so um it it, it uh it's classic left-wing uh science and ideology that you you rewrite the history to to uh, uh support the argument that, that you want to make and um as I said, it doesn't take long to show how wrong they are. Yeah. In this context, uh, Tim, I want to uh, uh, also uh, sort of educate or, or, or uh, explain to our people that you have a, you know, a, a, a scientific background because there was, you know, there was this talk or in the context of these discussions on Twitter. And thankfully, there are some intelligent people out there who really take the time and say, you know, here is a proof, here's a evidence, here are scientific studies, uh, you know, with a peer reviewed or not, but, but really uh, like multiple times uh, verified and researched. And, and, uh, and um, you are a historical clima climatologist, um, are yeah. you? Exactly. Yes, I am, yeah. Yeah, so right. that's important, I think, to emphasize. Uh, because it's always, you know, the people are demanding like, oh, where are the credentials? But then, uh, but then they take uh, for uh, strange reasons. I don't know. People like uh, Nathaniel uh, Rich or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah. Um, more serious. The guy is, uh, I don't know, a romantic essayist and uh, literature uh, expert, but but not a not a not a scientist or or not to mention a you know historical climat climatologist and why are these people taken more seriously um i mean i don't know about the backgrounds or who are they connected to um because i you know i could throw back the same arguments uh, people are uh, you know throwing out with um for example that the oil and gas industry is funding i know you know i know about deliberate scientific corruption because i studied the internal documents of the tobacco industry or the cigarette corporation yeah. for 15 years so i know how things work how this uh you know like controlling owning media entities enterprises uh, uh subverting scientific organizations corrupting scientists uh, corrupting and manipulating scientific hardcore data and facts for for many for many decades so uh what why uh i don't know anybody who is who is denying uh, the climate or or is uh, or is skeptical of the fact that the climate is changing of course it's changing but um uh, but why is nobody to, uh, why uh why is the the topic of the of the well yeah of the historical climatology yeah. of of the of the history not not being emphasized, uh, you know, not being discussed well, seriously. Well, what what goes on, uh, Kevin, is is if you're having an argument with somebody, or an argument's not a good word. It's become, it, it's it's the, in fact the connotation of it now is it's it's disputatious and it's it's uh, it's it's not it gets emotional rather than a, a solid argument, and and so um, I don't like to use that term. But in the debate, um, what in any debate. What happens is if you start to lose the argument on the facts, you usually, it's very common and very human to turn the argument to attacking the individual. Right. And the, the phrase that you, the, it, 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 if you look at the, there are five different forms of argument. And in those five forms of argument, one of them is argument ad hominem which is argument to the person. In other words, you, you stop s discussing the facts and you start saying, well, this person's paid by the oil companies or he's corrupt and he's got a, an agenda and so on. So this is what's going on here. 
Um, and so they're losing the argument on the facts because we're able to show that it was warmer a thousand years ago than today. And, and just that alone contradicts their, their, their theory and what they're trying to sell to the world. So because they're losing that argument, then they turn around and attack me, the individual. Oh, well, he's paid by the oil company, so you can't believe what he's saying. Of course, what's interesting about that is that does that mean then that if you're getting money from the government, you're not corrupted or you're not biased? In other words, you can't just say, well, if money from one influences you, well, then doesn't money from others influence you? Yeah, what and, about and, the IPCC, yeah. for example? I mean, they, yeah, they exactly. have lost total credibility in my eyes. In yes, my eyes. exactly. And, and, and so, of, of, of course, and, and this is the problem in today's world that, um, and I watched it in the university, you know, when, when I started uh, earlier, it was publish or perish. So if you got published, then you got promoted and you, guess, and, and you advanced your career. Uh, but um, it gradually changed. And I actually sat in a department personnel meeting where they wanted to promote this guy because he'd received a large amount of money from the government. Well, just because you receive money from the government doesn't mean to see your research is any good. Exactly. You know, and, and so it became more about how much money you were bringing in and how much money you were getting. Uh, that became a measure of the quality of your work. And then that's truly frightening. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, in retrospect, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't even, you know, you know, uh, sort of uh, let myself go into this discussion, especially not on, I shouldn't have done it on Twitter because I found an article. I, I thought, okay, the questions and the, uh, the questioning is relevant in within this context. And I, I hadn't even researched the, uh, you know, I didn't even know who this David Wojcik and the Hartlett Institute is. Maybe, yeah, maybe they, maybe they've received, maybe they had received, uh, money from uh, you know tobacco industry previously. To be honest with you, I mean, let's just take for example the German Cancer Research Center, you know, Deutsches Krebsforschungszentrum. Yeah. Uh, Krebs if you go back like decades ago, they are they also had um, you know a, a scientific corruption or let's say uh, a lobbying going on, a funding by the tobacco industry many decades ago. But does that make the science? which all the scientists are working for uh, irrelevant or, in, or not credible. Uh, so I think we need to you know, differentiate uh, and, and, and really go to the bottom of these things and, 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 and just ask, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the article I was referring to by this uh, David Wojcik or whatever his name is, yep. is, um, uh, is that about the question why the gas and oil industry what, whether it's true or not, have uh, have invest or have have paid a lot of money, up, approximately a billion dollars in total, to to diverse institutions. Now, I want to know your opinion. Why? What? What is their agenda? I mean, what, what is what is their motive um, to do that kind of thing? I, th I think one of the interesting things about business is that they essentially have been very honest about what they're doing. They're in it for profit. And if, if um, cr uh, creating research that allows you to enhance your profit, that's what they're going to do. And uh, so I have no problem um, if you're telling lies, as long as you tell me you're telling lies, right? So I can deal with that. I can put in a bias factor. Um, the problem comes when um, this, this uh, as, I, as I hinted at earlier, uh, that argument that, oh, well, if you get money from government, that somehow is not biased or influenced. And, and so you're very selectively applying your, your uh, credibility and criteria. My, my view is I never take anything at face value, ever. You question everything. And I taught my students that, that. question everything. And um, now people will say, well, then, you know, you're a skeptic, you're a cynic and all the rest of it. But no, that's the only healthy way to deal with it is, is that uh, ac except that anybody can lie to you and a lot of people are going to lie to you. And rather than trying to sort out who is and who isn't, just start with the assumption that they're all lying to you. That way you can't go wrong. If it holds up, 
And of course, that's the whole point about research. Even before you actually do the research, uh, show how you got the data, where you got the data, prove the credibility of the data before you present the data even. And, and we're not doing that anymore. And if you go back and look at articles uh, in the old days, you had to have an abstract that told you what the old article was, was about. But, but then the first part of the article was, look, here's how I got the data. Here's what I did. Here's the research that I, articles are published now and, and nobody explains what they did or how they did it or where they got the data from. You just, here's the article. Take it, take it uh, uh, on face value. Well, sorry, no, I, I don't, and I won't, and I never will. Yeah, and um, going to the core of this um, of this topic also is the the whole you know discussion about um, you know it, the discussion is is led in a way that as if the case is closed, like uh, you're a climate denier because you don't believe. Um, the, the climate uh, previously called global warming and now climate change uh, is uh, if you don't believe that it's it's not caused by uh, by CO2 by man made or human made uh, yeah. human caused CO2. Yeah. So uh, now it's already been proven by multiple times that that uh, the CO2 uh, levels follow the temperature. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. The the one one of the things about, well, first of all, there's the scientific method. And science, the scientific method is that you create a hypothesis. So your hypothesis may be that, well, look, if, if uh, uh, CO2 goes up, the temperature will go up. The hypothesis is based upon certain assumptions. And then you identify those assumptions. And, and in the old days of science, you had to put all of that into your article. You had to put what, well, what's the basis of this article? So that you show that this is one little piece of study that's on the end of a whole continuum of, of study, and that will add to going forward. Now, the argument is, oh, here's my study, and you just accept it for what it is. That's, that's very unhealthy for, for science. And, and so um, what I've always tried to do is say, well, look, here's the background. Here's, here's, I'm adding this on to the end of, of a continuum. And, and um, so, as I said, in the old days, you had to publish articles. You had to cite the historic literature that your work was a part of the continuum. Nowadays, you just publish the article and, and, and that's the end of it. There's no context then that's the critical thing. What's the context of what you're, what you're doing and what you're saying? Mm -hmm. and, and so what you've got is, is, is you've got thousands of articles out there, all unique in themselves, but, but where do you put them? So it's like having pieces of a puzzle with no box top. You know, where, where do we start putting? Well, all you can do is start saying, well, let's get the edge pieces and let's get the colors pile up the colors and, and develop some technique. And that's what people are having to do now in, in order to make some sense out of all of this, uh, all of this research and, and data that's coming in. Uh, you have to develop a, a very simple technique of sorting it before you can even start to analyze it. Right. And um, I don't hear any solutions i mean people when you talk to people uh, it's like even if even if it was human cost which is not um i don't I, you know i i never hear like uh, constructive solutions to the problem then okay we identified the problem uh but then the mainstream narrative is still uh yeah it is uh sort of th there's a consensus who made the consensus first of all can you talk about this, this whole consensus thing? I mean, well, the word consensus is is um, been kicking around uh, for quite some time now, and and it's been, been a very controversial issue. Um, a consensus, uh, you know, you, you could say, well, two people agree, that's a consensus, but but it was it it was used to uh, be, it became a scientific fact. In other words, what people started to say was, well, look, the consensus agree, therefore that in and of itself makes the argument valid. No, it doesn't. You know, I mean, the whole history of science, if you study it, 
And by the way, I think I would make that compulsory in all university courses and in all high school courses. Um, but the history of science is that that, that you, it's one article, it's one thing that brings a complete consensus down. And, and so the whole idea of science, and, and one of the things that we, I think we've lost sight of, partly because of course, we're so imbued with the idea of positive results. I watched colleagues and people do years of research. And then at the end, it came out to nothing. And they said, oh, it's a failure. I said, no, it isn't. It, it, what you've done is you said, look, this is a possible thing we should look at. Well, you've now proved that, no, don't look at that. You saved other people going down the same blind alleys. And that's an important part of science. And of course, it's one of the things that's, that's been a discussion in science for 50 years now is a publishing negative results. You only positive, you've only published positive results, which then, which then creates a terrible bias in the science. And, and people waste millions of dollars in time uh, pursuing something that somebody had already proved 40 years ago was wrong. But because they didn't publish those negative results, somebody else wastes their time. So I, th th this is part of what's going wrong with science. Yeah, but isn't Everything that also like a systemic problem in the intellectual, academic, may, you know, oh, yeah, established yes. university? Pro that Absolutely. Whoever, you know, there are people like having multiple PhDs, or, you know, uh, working in established universities, institutions. But bef uh, first of all, I guess it's about not losing face because, uh, you know, I guess after many uh, decades or centuries, it's hard, I guess, to look into the mirror and say, hey, you know what, uh, you know, we've come to a totally, uh, we've falsified whatever the, the established uh, doctrine or dogma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess it's a, it's a real problem. And then, you, and then, and then on, the other, on the other hand, it's the interdependency, financial interdependency, reputation. So is this a problem generally? Um, it's huge, huge problem. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, as, as I was suggesting earlier, um, the, uh, it became really problematic when uh, virtually all f research funding came from government. Mm -hmm. And therefore that di uh, directed and, and created uh, the view of the world and the view of, of components of the world that are in isolation. And, and so we, we really uh, are not doing proper science. Proper science should say, look, I, I think this is an issue that's your hypothesis. You then make certain assumptions about it and you do your research and you either prove the hypothesis or you don't prove the hypothesis. In proper scientific li uh, literature, that's referred to as the null hypothesis. And people think that's the negative. No, it isn't. The null hypothesis is simply saying, well, it wasn't this, therefore it's more likely to be this. And, and so people, and, and I, it's gone completely in the academic world of, of teaching how science thinks, how it works, what the scientific method is, you know, why were certain people so critical in the history of science? What was, what was the value of Copernicus and, and other people like this? And I don't think anybody should get a degree science or arts without a, a course in the history of science. And particularly in this world now where um, science is so much of our lives in, in every way. And if, if people don't understand how science works and how it achieves results, then you get what's going on today that you can con people into anything and buying anything and believing anything. Right. And um, when it comes to uh, the, the study of um climate change uh, uh yeah. because you talked about you know like thousands years ago actually we do have do we have data like going back even not only thousands but ten thousand hundred thousand years back on an inter interdisciplinary spectrum of of you know of disciplines uh you know would it be uh, geology uh meteorology i don't know uh, yeah, other... yeah. okay um 
that's that's a very very important question how do we reconstruct past temperatures yeah. and un unless you can do that with a, with some level of of confidence you can't possibly start analyzing what are the mechanisms that are causing those temperature changes and and so um th this has been a, a, a w w what has happened is it's been divided up into three general areas the first is the for our, uh, about the last 150 years we have adequate actual instrumental measurements of temperature precipitation and so on and and so that's that is referred to as the secular period and as i said it uh, some say back to 150 i don't think that anything before 100 years is is really of any value and and there's so little of it that it that it's an inadequate sample size and then before that you get into uh, data that you can obtain from historical records. And that's what's called proxy data, and that's what you're asking me about. So for example, um, if you've got a record of, um, well, I, 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 I'll give you an example of my own use. The, the, the Hudson Bay Company was a fur trade company in Churchill. Um, their whole winter survival depended upon the the number of geese that they shot in the spring. So when the geese came in from the south and they shot so many geese, then they salted them down. That became their food supply for the following winter. Well, of course, they record the date of arrival of the geese very accurately because it, it's their whole life depends on it. So what I did was I took the the date of a record of arrival of geese plotted that out over 300 years and of course you see then uh, that varies with the changing wind patterns in the subarctic and is is what we call a proxy indicator of climate and climate change or deduction so, out of it like it's yeah sort of exactly yeah exactly exactly so so this is uh, once you go before the instrumental period which as i said i think about 100 years then that's that's the major source of our data is proxy indicators from human observations date of planting date of, of, of harvest uh, you know and and for example one of the earliest ones was the uh, uh, in japan where they record the, the blossoms at the start of spring is with the blossoms in Japan. That that record is over 300 years in length. And of course, what it shows is the changing climate with the date on which the blossom actually occurred. And so this is the kind of thing that we can use to reconstruct, a, not, not very accurately, I've got to be careful here, but some indicator of the relative change of climate because uh, even with instrumental records you're not i i argue you're, you're one degree celsius plus or minus one degree even with instrumental records um when you go back into the historic record you're you're beyond one degree celsius uh, accuracy so um in terms of being able to say what the absolute temperature is not possible but in terms of the relative change of the temperature over time that's that's what that's the, the main thing that you can get out of this what about the uh you call it the geological ice core um uh, you know research um what what, what kind of uh, you know well th there's different uh, the the instrumental period as i said about 100 years of record mm -hmm. and then you've got the biologic record which is a much more bi biology is much more sensitive so for example the date arrival of, of geese in the spring that sort of thing the date on which um, uh, you harvested or you planted your seeds and how that changed over time so that that'll give you uh, some something uh, better or worse than it, what's the word i want but but not not as good as the actual instrumental record but say one and a half degrees of accuracy plus or minus and and uh, but then before that all you've got is the geologic record well if you you're taking lake sediments you know how accurate is that of, of an indicator of change and what is it reflecting is it reflecting temperature change so the let the you drill down and you get the layers of the sediment well uh, you know 
what do you use that for? Is it reflecting changes in the precipitation and the runoff into the lake? And is that then a reflection of temperature? So you're getting more snow or less snow? So all of these factors um, uh, complicate reconstruction of the past temperature and then even more difficult reconstruction of past precipitation. And so all you really have are proxy indicators, secondary indicators. I personally would never ever publish or do research using just one proxy indicator. Mm -hmm. That you must always have something and those things must be independent of each other so that you've got one record over here that that is a function of, of temperature or whatever another record over here that's a function of precipitation and so that you and and that in in the in the climate field is called relative homogeneity so you want to get a homogeneous record but it it's it's got to be relative so in other words you can say well this area is getting wetter or drier or warmer cooler and this area is, is the opposite. Well, then you've got a chance of understanding how the mechanisms are changing to create those conditions because we know the general mechanism of, of the Earth's climate and how it works. And, and uh, so th this is how you reconstruct it. But, but the important thing is not, the, not necessarily absolute temperature records or absolute precipitation, but the relative changes over time. Yeah. Um, thanks for that uh, elaboration. Uh, Tim, so uh, we talk, I know we talked about this uh, last time um, yeah. about the root causes. Um, like uh, there's, there's really uh, uh, amazing studies being done on uh, you know, the, the root, you know, the causes of, of electromagnetic fields uh, um, or ma magnetic or gravitational uh, field strengths yeah. or the sun, uh, the, the the tilt of the earth. There are multiple factors playing playing here f for this, uh, you know, f for this sudden, abrupt or, or, or you know, very natural cycles of, of climate change. Uh, yeah. Isn't it, uh, isn't that the case? Yes, that is the case, but, but here's the problem. It's only in the last 40 or 50 years, and I would say even less than that, uh, that people have become aware of more of the mechanisms that can cause temperature change and or climate change. So, for example, I remember uh, going to a conference, uh, conferences where people that introduced Milankovitch, that is the change in the tilt and the change in the orbit, which we now accept, where people were booed off the stage for mentioning Milankovitch. You, you didn't dare. And I remember very, very clearly, because it was such an issue for me, at a conference in Ottawa in 1985, where somebody talked about a temperature record and intimated that some of the record was being caused by Milankovitch changes and nobody questioned it. Mm -hmm. That was the first conference where somebody cited Milankovitch as a, a possible explanation where it wasn't immediately challenged. And then of course, from then on, uh, it, 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 once, once something's accepted, then everybody wants to get on the bandwagon and, and it can go too far the other way. So suddenly now everything's explained by Milankovic, you know. Uh, but but um, that, that is a, a very important part of science and understanding. At what point do um, reasonable explanations and mechanisms uh, get accepted by the wider community? Because you see what happens, and I used to tell my students this, uh, you're coming to me and I'm going to teach you what was said before me, right? And you're going you're gonna to add to that, well, I'm only telling you what is today's truth. It wasn't yesterday's truth and it won't right. be tomorrow's truth. But, but people have it in their minds, oh, the truth is the truth. No, the truth is constantly changing, mm -hmm. and, and and people can't understand that, and I, they, people can't even understand how and my students. I we used to laugh about this. Well, 
But how, how did people live before we understood Milankovitch? You know, it can't possibly work. Yeah, but it, it and this, by the way, is a very interesting concept with regard to societies, economics, change. You know, people couldn't imagine a, a non-monetary society. You know, the, just simply barter, trade, and and, and, and these sorts of things. Um, so we become very much a victim of uh, what we're taught about the view of the world, and that becomes, unfortunately, a rigid view of the world and, and the only view of the world, when we really should keep a very open mind about everything. Just say, well, that's what you're saying now, but <laughs> that, that's the better way, to, a healthier way to look at it. Right. And now, now that the European Central Bank has also uh made uh, the the uh, sort of the, the climate change propaganda hy hysteria uh, if, uh into its own program or integrate it into its own political monetary fiscal agenda uh, i mean it should it should raise you know uh, it should uh, it should be actually a wake up call for people but okay let's talk about you know the solutions uh, I, I never hear solutions. I mean, that would mean if it was CO2, if it was seriously human caused CO2, which is not, then um, then we would need to, you know, s stop our, you know, our, our lifestyle, our civilization yeah. as it is. So either we, c I mean, in my strong opinion and, and my, according to my research, either we come up with new technologies that are totally non-combustible, -com non-combustible, mm -hmm. non-burning fuels. Um, we need totally either new innovative technologies or suppressed technologies which have been hidden or uh, compartmentalized uh, uh, or patented and, and seized and confiscated and then you know bring it onto the surface and develop these new technologies. So uh, do you ever hear uh, you know, constructive logical solutions um, to the problem? Um if we're going towards, for example, yeah. an ice age, I yeah, mean, if yeah, we're going yeah, okay. long term to an ice age, are we going to stop it? How how would we stop it? Should we stop it? Mm -hmm. This this idea of of um, interfering with the climate, uh, humans have done that forever. I mean, rain dances are an attempt by humans to influence the climate, and now, of course, we do it. To, we think we do it more technically and more accurately with cloud seeding and the sorts of things, um, but the but what I always warn people is if you don't know what you're doing, you're better not do it at all. Um, and and there, ha there are many lawsuits around the world, but particularly in the US. For example, uh, one farmer um, in, in the north, uh, northern part of the US in the dry region, um, he paid for cloud seeding. To, is to that help part his, of the geoengineering, like the yes. civil military yeah, but, geoengineering? Uh, well, it's, it's not just military, but but, but military have done. A, yeah, I mean, I, I I did a whole lot of work with the military on on uh, fighting wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Soviets, um, their their whole plan was to introduce energies and and cause storms and 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 trigger things like that. But, but the difficulty in, on, on a civilian point of view was this one farmer said, well, I, I, my crop is, is, I'm losing my crop and I'm going to do some cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. And um, he did that. The problem is that it, it created um, uh, hail on his neighbor's crop. And then it caused flooding in a local dam that caused the dam to burst and 12 people died. Unbelievable. So, so of course, that's the difficulty mm -hmm. is where does the liability come if you're going to start? And, and of course, I always argue, and I mentioned this last time, it, it's, it's hard to be God. It's hard to play God, right? And and so the, the, this is the stage that we're at now. But of course, part of the, part of, one of the things about humans is, Every benefit we have also has a very negative side. So the arrogance that we have, that we think we can change the climate, is arrogance. And it can cause you all sorts of hell, but if you're going to advance and, and control things more and understand things more, that's what you've got to do. There's risk in everything. And, and, um, and but of course, the, nobody has really discussed uh, the liability uh, uh, of the risks of playing with the climate. 
um, there, there were some uh, uh, threats. The, the Soviets, for example, um, and the S Scandinavia said, look, we're getting enormously powerful uh, electronic signals from the Soviet Union. And um, is that the HARP project? I mean, because there are multiple ones, HARP? Is that HARP, 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 HARP which stands for High Altitude uh, Research Project? Um, and, and it actually, uh, some say it's H A A R P. Um, but, but that was um, uh, all of these things are mixed up with military. Right. So, for example, one of the things that was a problem during the Cold War was the ability of the, the Soviets to swamp our uh, radio signals. So, of course, if you can't communicate, you lose the war. And, and so what they did was they said, well, why don't we thicken the ionosphere, the F layer, and then we can bounce HF signals off of that. Well, then... They, start, they, they found that the, the Soviets started to develop satellites that could eliminate the F layer. So all of these games have been going on. Um, unfortunately, so much of it is in warfare. So much of our human advances are, are come from warfare. I wish we could do things for peaceful purposes right. more often. But, but certainly, um, in, in terms of controlling the atmosphere, the primary issue was uh, the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, now that, that of course, um, was somewhat superseded by once the satellite era came in. So you could, all you needed was three satellites in geos geosynchronous positions to cover the whole globe. But then they developed the killer satellites. So you had a satellite that could shoot down another satellite. And this battle is still going on, by the way. This this uh, conflict, um, but um, yeah, unfortunately, it's all driven by battles rather than uh, human advancement. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's why you know I'm I'm I have a total uh, trust and um, in in the power of the uh, in the change of the monetary system. It all starts with the monetary system, but you know it's a yeah. uh, it's a uh, you know chapter for itself. Um, and and why, yeah. while you're also mentioning the military industrial complex um, in a way, uh, didn't didn't the military industrial complex on whatever side, you know, whether Americans or Soviets, uh, you know, detonate a bunch of uh, like many hydrogen and nuclear bombs in the stratosphere or in the ozone layer? Uh, is that? Yeah, all of those were attempts to change the structure of the atmosphere because the way you bounced your signals off of it or the way that uh, signals came from satellites and so on. So it's always been about interfering with, with your enemy's uh, communication systems. And so much of that was dependent, certainly in, in the days before satellites, uh, was dependent totally upon the atmosphere and and but but concentrated as I said on the ionosphere and the F layer because you could bounce HF signals because the problem was the curvature of the Earth. How do you right. get a signal from here to the other side of the Earth? Well, they discovered they could do it by bouncing signals mm -hmm. off the F layer. But could well, that it, cause yeah. uh, an, a temporary change in the in you know in the at atmosphere climate or? Weather? Oh yes, yes, and any a anything that you do to cause change requires energy input, which is then going to affect the energy that, that you're affecting. Um, the, big, the bigger question is um, how much energy is hum are humans capable of producing? Um, I remember there was um, a, a, a discussion about dealing with the ozone layer, and somebody said, Look, well, why don't we produce ozone at ground level and then put it up and fill in and, and you know heal the ozone layer. And then somebody calculated that it would take all the energy that humans produce in total to get enough ozone to do that. So you get into these economies of scale. The, the big issue, uh, uh, or, or sorry, everything in climate as, uh, came down to energy. And, and that was uh, Bojiko, the, the Soviet, uh, um, researcher who was the first to start doing energy balance models instead of temperature models. 
so so that he said look you can understand the dynamics of the atmosphere and climate systems better if you have a full energy budget understanding of it and that was a huge change that came in in the 1950s exactly so um tim um if we don't have any uh, and in my strong opinion, in, according to my research, what I've learned from you and other uh, uh, scientific uh, studies and researchers, um, we don't have really an influence. I mean, whether we are, you know, driving with SUVs or diesel yeah. or, or gasoline or, you know, uh, flying with planes, even if, if that was all gone, <laughs> I think people need to understand, did, does that have, would that have any kind of effect on on temperature and climate? No, I, I, all of this is based around human arrogance and our belief that we're bigger and better than we are and that we can do more damage or do more good than we can. And um, all you have to do is say, look, if, if you take everybody off the planet and leave one scientist behind and ask her to measure the difference in the CO2 level, she wouldn't be able to detect any difference. So that's, that's really the best way to uh, create an analogy so people can understand what's actually happening. Um, our, our contribution to the CO2 in the atmosphere is a very, very small portion. And CO2 itself, of course, is a very small part of the atmosphere. Right. It's less, less than 4%, yeah. I mean, believing that carbon, a CO2, that yeah. we emit or we cause whatever you know technologies or combustion or whatever would in any i mean what, what is the percentage here that we we are caught we are sort of uh adding to the co2 level is that what uh, a couple of percent it's, or what yeah is it it no it, it's not even one percent but see <laughs> here's where the problem came richard lindson said that uh, the bureaucrats dream is to control carbon mm -hmm. now that is a political comment and an economic comment, but it implies a, a, a physical and, and climate comment, but it doesn't. So what, what Lindzen is saying is for uh, governments and people that want to control, if they can control the energy, I mean, that this was Hitler's problem. Mm -hmm. He had no oil, right. right? And he had to start producing oil out of coal and all sorts of attempts to, to create that oil. So that, that's why uh, these things get confused, uh, but, but it gets confused in the sense that uh, the amount that humans ca can produce is, is of no significance on a global scale. But it is very, very significant. In fact, it's absolutely essential on a socioeconomic scale. And that, that's where the, the confusion uh, develops. So, um, as you say, the, the amount that, of CO2 we produce or the amount of oil that we use relative to the, to the r reservoir is, is insignificant. Right. So, to wrap this up, Tim, um, yeah. uh, um, wh why is it that, uh, okay, if, if the average person out there cannot imagine that there is an you know, there's an agenda or there's an intention behind all these uh, artificially fabricated, uh, you know, political, whatever agendas or, or discussions and, and uh, scientific corruption. What is, what is the end goal here? What, I mean, what do you think is the end goal to, 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 to tax more people or what, what is, what's well, the ultimate the, goal? Well, what, for a politician, the ultimate goal is to tax. And that's all they but want. Beyond, is I mean, beyond the politicians, beyond, I mean, their beyond, structures. Beyond, yeah. Be, beyond the political, it's about control. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all about control. And, and if you can control both the ideas and the actual uh, physical elements, then you can control the world. And you can control people. And uh, so, uh, and, and one, of the, one of the ways to look at this is to look at what revolutionary governments do. What's the first thing that a revolutionary government does when they take power? The first thing is they take control of all the communications, TV, radio stations, grab control of that. It's much, mu that's more complicated now, by the way, because of the internet, right? That it, it can transcend boundaries and this is what uh, 
dictators and communist countries are finding. Um, so the, the communications is the first thing. The second thing is the energy. I mean, right. if you look at what, what has America done in, in, in Syria right now, they said, oh, we've pulled out of everything except the oil fields. <laughs> Okay. Well, why don't you leave the oil fields as well? Oh, well. Yeah. Didn't you tell us that you're now self-sufficient in oil? Right. Well, what's going on here? So, so when when you look at at the way governments and, and, and when, as I said, uh, when when you look at uh, a revolution, what's the first thing that happens? Take over the uh, communications and then grab the energy. That and, and that tells you everything you need to know. The third thing, uh, uh, ironically, is, is the food supply. And and one of the things that you go back through history, for example, in, in Egyptian days, uh, uh, pharaohs prided themselves, and you can read this in their tombs on the walls, they prided themselves on the ability to feed their people, mm -hmm. to be able to have enough food every year and we can't understand that today's world. We can't imagine that that you could have a, a, a an inability to feed your your people. But it's not less well about a hundred years ago when we had situations like that, where where a government simply couldn't feed its people, and and so that's the ultimate uh, control. And when people get hungry, they get very nasty. <laughs> so so it. This, this is what, what's so difficult now is that we understand and, and we see the use of these controls, but we can't apply that to the historical record. And so when we look at history, we have to look at it in a, a completely different context than our, our view of, of today's world. And that, by the way, that, that goes historically, but it also goes regionally. Because, right. you know, North Americans can't imagine uh, conditions in Southeast Asia, for example, and the different value systems that they have and what's important. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, um, it's a wonderfully complex world. You know, Tim, in conclusion, uh, I find it mind boggling. We have really serious problems on this planet. I mean, yeah. really environmental problems. We have yeah. uh, this, uh, I mean, in my opinion, this whole uh, coronavirus thing is uh, either a totally stupid, uh, grossly negligent thing they have done or totally intentional so that some some pharmaceutical, yeah. I don't know, or some, some, some uh, you know, chain reactions triggered so somebody profits uh, or some entities profit from this whole, uh, you know, uh, disastrous uh, chaos and, and tragedy. Uh, people are dying. Um, do you have an opinion? Just in conclusion, do you have an opinion on the uh, coronavirus? Would yes. Well, well partly, of course, um, and you're absolutely right. What What's really a threat to us are not talked about. The, the issues that the media want to sensationalize and, and, and people that want to control you sensationalize. But for example, uh, I, I, at, at, a, at a conference a couple of years ago, I was asked, well, what's the most, uh, what's the biggest threat to the world? Mm -hmm. And I said, soil erosion. <laughs> well, the, the audience just was shocked. It's so know. in plain sight, but people don't talk about it. Huh? Exactly. And they don't realize how little soil there is. Yeah, and 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 certainly in terms of of good quality soil, you know, the, there's very very little of it in the world, and yet that's the whole basis of of our food supply, and so this this is the sort of, of thing that uh, really interests me, and 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 that people need to become aware of. Um, so that 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 it's just the people's view of the world is distorted by the media, by the education, by the governments. Um, and, um, and, and there's in many times or many cases, it's a deliberate distortion and de deception uh, in order to keep the people in control. So anyway, hopefully the internet is gradually breaking through that and people are mm -hmm. starting to learn more things in, in a wider way. And, and, um, and I think that's healthy. Yeah. And, you know, on a positive note, just uh, to, to yeah. wrap, really wrap this up is that there are really some people like, uh, I don't I forgot this uh, young, uh, there's a young man, um, ocean cleanup, uh, you know, with this ocean cleanup oh, yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. At least, you know, I mean, I know it's it's still a really minuscule thing to do. But it, there's a lot of work to do. But at, at least there's a young guy, you know, or, or woman, you know, trying to do something 
out there uh, trying to innovate, develop, you know, and 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 invent something and really do something practically, a practical solution yeah. out there. So I okay. wish there were more people like that, you know. But but that goes back to your earlier comment that uh, we we identify all these problems, but you hardly ever hear anybody talking about solutions. Right. And and uh, and of course, part of the reason for that is governments don't want to be confronted with solutions, and then. Uh, uh, societies don't want to be confronted with the cost of solutions. Right. That, that if you say, well, uh, all right, um, w we can solve the problem if you all stop eating bacon and eggs, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to pay the price that is necessary for many of these solutions, and that that's a difficulty too. What would be the structural change that you would envision? I mean, I, I have mine because, you know, there's why that's the reason I'm so obsessed with, uh, with the, uh, you know, monetary root cause, uh, you know, yeah. why I'm such a huge advocate of Bitcoin because it takes away the issuance of money, not only from the governments, but especially from the central banks and the whole yeah. structure around it. And, and, and I mean, certainly economics uh, it drives everything and, and you, you've got to put a value on everything. But, but for me, uh, as an educator, it's education. Okay. The education system, we've got to stop using it to indoctrinate people. Right. So education has become indoctrination. And um, so I, I, we're much, much healthier if we create students who are constantly questioning everything. Right. And we talked about this last time. And, and so, um, and if you don't get answers, start asking, why aren't you getting answers? And that, but you could even begin before that and say, well, why aren't people asking these questions? And part of it is because they, they don't know enough to ask the right questions. Right. I, I, I discovered that in the classroom because I used to encourage students to ask questions. Then I realized they didn't know enough to ask what, what questions to ask. And invariably, in most classes, you get some person who wasn't particularly bright, but just happened to stumble across the right question. And everybody in the class says, oh, well, good. I'm glad they asked that. Right. And, and, and that's then, a fun, fu fundamental yes. problem, Tim, right? I mean, yes. it, it, it yeah. starts in the compartmentalized educational system. Yeah. Children, I myself, to be honest with you, I, yeah. I, I had really good grades in school, but I, I, yeah. I never know, you know, the fuck what I was learning here. You know, I had <laughs> right, really right. like yeah. so many A plus, but I didn't know what an, I, I never questioned like, what is an electron? You know, yeah. Yeah. what is this and that? We just, you know, learn by memorize things and then regurgitate and then you know throw it I'll you know yeah it, i'll tell you how bad incredible. the problem is yeah mm -hmm. I, I i mentioned this last time i had uh, several students used to come to my class that weren't even registered in the class and then i would hold uh, i would give talks at lunchtime on a whole bunch of issues like um how how did you fill out registration when you came to the university and to the information and, and the number of people, I, I would have two, three hundred every week come in to that kind of talk. Incredible. But nobody would ever think, nobody in the administration, go, oh, that's so obvious to them, right? What's obvious to you is not obvious to other people. You cannot make that assumption. Mm. And, and now, of course, then the, the challenge for you as a, as a lecturer or, or talking to people is, well, at what point do I become too obvious that I'm wasting their time? But at what, at what point am I starting to fringe into things that they need to know, but are not likely to find a place to, to ask that or hear that talked about? And, and so this is, to me, is the great challenge. Um, and, and so I always, at the, at the, and, and by the way, I started every, class with a, a comment about something that was in the news that that related to um, uh, the course but the other thing was that in the first lecture I would always make a few subtle jokes and then I would watch the students and of course the the bright ones the eyes are twinkling back at you the rest of the class it's right over the top yeah. of their head yeah. with those students i used to call them and i told them at the end of the year i'd say you were my bellwether students because if i said something and i looked at you and and you were going what the hell is he talking about <laughs> then i knew i'd lost the whole class 
That's a good right? measure, measuring stick. Yeah. <laughs> a good measure. And, and so, but you see, these are things that I don't, uh, I've talked about this quite a bit. Nobody had ever in any education program or teaching teachers how to teach, talk about things like that. And yet that's so fundamental to the whole communication process. Yeah. And, and um, now yeah. I'm lucky, I, I, the good Lord gave me a natural ability to teach. Yeah. And I'm very grateful for that. But, but um, there's so, I, I would say 80% of the teachers are just journeyman teachers. Right. They, they learn the mechanics of it. Yeah. And hopefully enough of it gets across. But, but we, I, I would rather see uh, uh, classes of 300 with very effective teachers in front of them than this idea that, oh, you maximum class size of 30 with, with useless teachers in front of them. Yeah. And you're spot on, you know, and, and, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that there's so many, especially in the United States and probably elsewhere, so many people coming out of college universities, you know, having a, maybe a college university degree, totally high in, in debt um, yeah. and having no jobs. I mean, what do they learn, you know, and, yeah. and, and to be honest, I mean, I, we can't even blame them. We cannot blame our no. teachers. We cannot blame no. every, anybody because the whole system is so indoctrinated, so much, you know, yeah. Uh, brainwashing going on, so much propaganda and 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 systematic uh, agenda behind it. But people cannot even imagine that. Just because people cannot imagine, it doesn't mean you know there are certain entities or group of people that you know are propagating this. Right. I mentioned I mentioned earlier looking at civilizations and and uh, you know how they grow and how they decline, and of course this is part of it. That that they become so uh, wrapped up in their own uh, view of things that they're unable to adapt or adjust to change and they collapse. So that they, they collapse from within. They very, very rarely collapse from outside. Um, now, they, you can't, I mean, the Roman Empire, for example, you can name the, the date on which the barbarians arrived at their gates of Rome, but Roman society had been failing for 150 years before right. that. And, and so uh, this, uh, we, we need to do more as a society uh, of, of, and a political view of the larger picture. Polit politicians only look at four years or six years at the most, get my pension and I'm out of here. But, but we really need much, much better continuity of leadership and, and um, an understanding within the society. Um, and I don't, I don't know how you change that, whether it's too, whether a society becomes so rigid that it dies of its own rigidity collapses of its own rigidity it, it appears that way it appears that way yeah from yeah. all sides yeah from every yeah. side but so tim ho um, hopefully we can do it differently yeah uh <laughs> so tim i, I really yeah. enjoyed our talk again it's it's it, i learned so much and and so as a final message to you know i always i always you know tell everybody don't believe me don't tell don't believe right. anybody with a scientist or pseudo scientist or anybody yeah. just do your own research question everything and look at the you know it takes yeah. time. It takes uh, it takes a little bit of maybe self discipline uh, or open mindedness, uh, curiosity. Yeah. This is what we need to relearn, I guess. But what would your final message and where would you direct your you know my listeners or our viewers to any kind of videos, presentations, books, um, which I've already mentioned? Yeah. Uh, well, if you look at history, there are very very few people who uh, are able to um, create uh, global change. Mm -hmm you know, Copernicus and things like this. But he wasn't out to do that. It was just his ideas. Um, but every single one of us uh, it can change one little thing. And if you have that opportunity to change something, do it. Don't just say, no, I'll leave that for the next person. The only way that we improve is very, very micro incremental steps. That, that yes, there are, revolutionary changes but they're they're they are just that they're revolutionary but but um a society uh, if it's going to improve can only improve by these micro in incremental steps of every individual and and so um i would i would and i this is what i tried to train in my students say no you, you're gonna you're gonna have an impact it might be very very small but uh, every, if everybody did it, 
then we would we have a much greater chance of evolving a, a, a good and better society. Right. Uh, Tim, any other uh, final um, info, uh, materials you want to direct people to, like your website? Um, is it still active, like drtimball.com? It, it's not active right now um, uh, because uh, I had all sorts of problems with right. uh, GoDaddy and so on. Uh, so it, it should be up. But but what yeah. I urge what I urge people to do, and I urge my students to do this, there. Um, and Time Life Books did it for a while, where they published sets of books that were that everybody should read, and they included novels and mysteries and so on. There's a certain um, intellectual core to Western civilization, and if you don't understand that, you're really not going to have a, a satisfying life or a, an explained life. So I would urge everybody to get a list of of about maybe a dozen books and read them. Um, and it's not hard to get on the internet and find people who've made up these kinds of lists of books. And But don't just take any one list. Take, take books that appear on everybody's list, right? And, and that way you will then um, uh, get books that will provide you with uh, the fundamentals of Western society philosophical, intellectual, and emotional, and everything else. And um, so th that's really what you need to, to get to. What, what, what is the core? Right, yeah. So Tim, thank you so much for your time. Uh, your Twitter handle is uh, Pipilonia. Uh, I'm gonna Apollonia. put that in the, sh in the show oh, that's, notes. Yeah, Apollonia, that's my wife's name. A-P-P-L-O-N-I-A. <laughs> yeah, -P -P -A. yeah okay. I love that, lovely Greek name. Exactly. And you got uh, the, these two books uh, I've always yeah. also mentioned in the beginning right. of our talk, The Deliberate Corruption of Climate Science and yeah. Human Caused Global Warming, The Biggest Deception in History yeah. by Dr. Tim Ball. So yeah, uh, if, you have, if you don't have any other uh, you know, um, uh, information or, or uh, recommendations, We'll wrap this up, Tim. Thank you so much, and hope to get you back soon. Thank you so much for you know for for sharing your knowledge with everybody. Thank, thank you, Kevin, and ready ready to talk anytime. All right, have a good day. So, what you make of this? I really enjoyed our talk again with Dr. Tim Ball. Tim is really you know inspirator, uh, and uh, in, uh, he empowers people to to you know search for themselves, research for themselves, question everything. Uh, be open-minded, be curious, be skeptical of everything. Don't believe me, don't believe, uh, you know, Dr. Tim Ball or any other scientist or pseudoscientist or uh, prop propagandist <laughs> or, or any other podcaster. Just do your own research, you know, go deep, take a little bit of time, watch videos, interviews, presentations. There's so much, so many materials out there. Just, you know, uh, uh, just, uh, you know, question everything i think that's the that's the bottom line and ask questions ask yourself is it is what are the root causes how can we change it uh is the mainstream narrative and the mainstream propaganda we've been in indoctrinated uh really the truth or is there you know um an objective truth um a verifiable truth uh data facts scientific research studies um uh, would it be, you know, climatic histology, uh, historical climatology, or any other, you know, interdisciplinary field of, of science and research? Um, yeah, so if you love this show, please, uh, as much as I did, give it a like, subscribe, share, follow, retweet, uh, give me a, uh, some kind of comment, a feedback. If you want, write me an email to hello at the total .com or uh, kd at kvandavani.com, but I guess the other email address is much easier. Hello at the at uh, the totalconnector.com. You can um, follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Kevandavani. It's all in the show notes. I would really appreciate your feedback, any positive review. And if you are an ethical sponsor, please get in touch with me. Um, I'm really looking for ethical sponsors so I can really deliver more highest quality uh, video and or podcast interviews. Uh, around the world with really uh, highly knowledgeable and, and wise uh, scientists, researchers, experts, uh, um, any other people, you know, who, who, who can 
uh, elevate our level of, of knowledge, of comprehension, of understanding, and uh, of evolution, uh, finally. All right, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening or for watching on YouTube and talk to you soon again, Total Connector.